Hi, I'm Jessica with Sennheiser, and thank you so much for joining us today as we have a roundtable discussion about inner monitoring systems and the basics of inner monitoring. We're going to be hearing from several different perspectives within the music industry with our guests, Katie Cole, David Black, and Brad Baisley. So thanks all for joining us. Indeed. Mm -hmm. And uh, why don't we just go around and have you all tell just a bit about yourselves, uh, starting with you, Katie. Hey, I'm Katie Cole. I'm uh, originally from Australia and via Los Angeles, and I live in Nashville. I'm a Americana artist, but I'm also a touring musician in the Smashing Pumpkins. Awesome. And what about you, David? I am the touring drummer for country artist Phil Vassar, uh, a member of the rock tribute band Colin Ray and the Riff Raff. And in my spare time, a few days a week, I play that lower Broadway scene as both um, a singer and a drummer as well. Very cool. And what about you, Brad? I'm a professional monitor engineer. I currently am on tour with Blake Shelton. Great. So we're going to launch into some questions about inner monitoring and uh, just go over some basics, starting at a very basic level. Uh, let's just touch on what exactly is inner monitoring. So I'm going to throw it to you, Brad, for this one. All right, well, uh, starting in the beginning of live entertainment, people would hear themselves from speakers on the stage, on the floor, pointed at them. And that was common for a long time, it's still done today. And uh, in the early 90s, people figured out that if they put small earphones in their ears, uh, they could hear themselves more clearly and uh, hear the other musicians on stage more clearly as well. Awesome. So I know all of you are using inner monitors um, in your various roles. Can you all just kind of talk about when you first transitioned to inner monitors? So when that transition first took place, maybe starting with you, Katie. Um, I know I'd used them a couple of times randomly for some shows that didn't actually have um, space on the stage for you know normal basic wedges. Um, but then I transitioned fully after um, doing larger shows with the Smashing Pumpkins. They, you know, it's a, just a requirement. You just, it's really kind of impossible to do arena shows and larger shows with that basic setup and get the sound that you want without having sound reflecting off everything. Um, but I've been using them on and off for those types of touring. Um, and I also end up using them to do live streams just so that you don't, I can hear exactly what my mix is going out to people on the interwebs. And I also use them shooting um, videos for YouTube as well. The same thing, because I do live, live videos and I just want to make sure what I'm recording, because I don't mime. <laughs> I actually record live, so I like to hear what I'm doing, but I don't want the bulkiness of having a set of cans over my ears, because it's, I mean, it looks great when you're doing like the cool studio shot, whatever, but for just general performance, it's, it's, it inhibits the way that you look. So. Um, it's cosmetic as well as being like a proficient way to listen to things. Um, so I use them in a, different, a couple of different ways. Awesome. Yeah, and what about you, David? You guys will get a kick out of this. Mm -hmm. Years ago, I did a, I want to say it was about a nine or ten week mall tour. Oh, ace. Mm. <laughs> with a, um, a teenage female singer. Mm -hmm. um, much like what Debbie Gibson did. Mm -hmm. And Tiffany did. That's what I was picturing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, back in the, the 80s. And as anybody knows, when you walk into a shopping mall and clap your hands in the atrium, it just is a massive, massive sound. So they were looking for ways, their, her production or her management were looking for ways to lessen the volume. Mm -hmm. Because they carried everything with them, even the stage, PA, everything, mm -hmm. because, of course, a mall doesn't have such a thing. So they wanted the band not on wedges to cut down on the volume that mm -hmm. would be in the room. So it was mandatory that everybody wear uh, in-ears, which I loved from the first second I did it, and I've never gone back. I don't ever play live without, without in-ears. So it sounds like for both of the two of you, you were trying to address the, the challenge of your environment in switching over to the in-ears. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep, Absolutely. Definitely. 
Cool. And what about you, Brad? My first exposure to in-ear monitors was in college 25 years ago. I had a professor named John Fischel who showed us how to use in-ear monitors to adjust microphones in the recording studio so you could listen to them while you were moving the microphone. So that was sort of my first exposure to it. Um, and then my first big tour was with Clint Black and Clint has always been sort of an early adopter of new technologies. Uh, he was one of the first people I ever heard of to have a digital console and also he had the himself and the entire band using in-ear monitors. So that was my first real tour with them back then. Cool. Um, so with you all transitioning to ears, um, would you say would you say that that's helped your your workflow? Absolutely. It simplifies the stage setup immensely from having to carry around a bunch of floor monitors for all the musicians. Um, and then it allows the musicians to be anywhere on the stage and hear everything they want to hear the same way, no matter where they are on the stage. Well, what about you two, Katie and David, having used floor wedges and transitioning over to in-ear monitors? Did you have any apprehension or concerns in making that change? Um, well, personally, I remember like one of the um, one of the sort of pinnacle moments, I suppose, for me was doing the In Plain Song tour. It was the second leg of a tour with the Pumpkins, and that was in 2016. And we were doing theaters, and like I love theaters, and I love. I'm so I was still so used to the listening to, through the wedges and listening to the front of house for pitch and time it and your idea of pitch will always be fine listening out the front, but timing is a different thing. And if you're listening for changes, transitions, things like that. And at that point in time, I was playing bass. Um, I play keys and sing in the band now, but I was playing bass and singing in the band. And I was one of the only people on stage with wedges and everyone else had in-ears pretty much. And it's, it's just a totally different ballpark because you're like, I'm fine, but it, it changes. Like it's kind of set and forget once you have a really good monitor mix when you've got in-ears in and you can show up to any venue, any arena, especially festival shows. We didn't do sound checks for festivals. It was pretty much just like, you're good, yep, okay, and, and you're on. It was, you know, crazy stuff like that. But the difference between that tour and the tour afterwards, which was arenas with in-ears, was just, it was night and day, because you know exactly what you're gonna get. You can adjust like the little variances that happen from venue to venue at your sound check, check and that's all you need. It's just like, ah, oh, a little bit less of this. I'm fine. And that's it. It's not like, uh, this is like the bass is is flying all over the place in sound check and then it's gone or whatever it is. There's none of that. It's just it's very consistent. Right. And, you know, that's a good point about the consistency. And David, I know you playing down on Broadway, every venue that you step into is is going to have a different sound and different wedges. Um they also, you know, from what I've experienced on Lower Broadway, there's kind of a revolving door of audio people at some of those venues. Sure. Um, and would would you say that the inner monitors have helped your consistency and um, just set it and forget it and having that consistent sound venue to venue? I, you know, I guess so. It, I st um, one thing that you mentioned, talking about ben being beneficial, having in-ears. As a drummer, it's way less taxing on your ears. Mm -hmm. um, being able to isolate everything because, I mean, stand next to a crash cymbal and have somebody hit it. And imagine going through that for, you know, yeah. two, three hours. I can't, really honestly, acts that, you know, played really loud, like, like what would it have been like to be the who mm -hmm. and have only wedges to go off of. Mm -hmm. um, what would that do to your hearing after you? How can those guys, how can Roger Daltrey hear anything anymore? Yeah. Probably well, so many of those bands have tinnitus or they're partially got, deaf as got, a result. They've it's, got it. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, first of all, that's, that's the most beneficial thing for me as a drummer. In um, playing down on that Broadway scene, yeah, they have, um, to be blunt, uh, some of the sound is good in some of those bars and some of those sound is not very good. And some of the people working uh, that sound are good and some are not that good. But at the very least, for me, having in-ears uh, where I can just plug the XLR into a pack, or whatever, however I'm doing it, whether they give me a, a, a wireless pack and, or whether I'm corded and I just hang it on my belt, um, 
I know at least I'm going to be able to hear what I need to hear in order to get through the gig. Yeah. It may not be fantastic, mm -hmm. but it's way more beneficial for me than to just go off the room uh, because some of those rooms are bad rooms. Yeah. And yeah. some of the clubs down there on Lower Broadway have digital consoles where they can just recall yeah. the last time you were in there. So yeah. you get it right once, you come back in two weeks, they'll just pull it up again. Yeah. Just how you had it last time you were there. Yeah. With wedges and depending on the room, everything else that you're dealing with, the venue might be different as I was touching on earlier, like the rever reverberation of bass or this key or that key or depending if the audience is full or not. Everything changes the sound in every room and that can vary wildly from venue to venue. But with in-ears, it's, it's so consistent that you don't end up having to push as hard. You'd be, you, want, you are singing or performing at a comfortable like you, you still, I'm not saying you're underperforming, but you don't have to sing harder or play harder in order just for the, I can hear it now. I, you mm. don't do any of that. Your performance doesn't suffer. It, it's, it's more like a recording studio environment where it's controlled and you're just doing your best performance. It's not like I'm, you know, if you were to listen back, you're like, that's exactly how I performed it. Whereas a live version of something you may think is great and then you hear a live recording and you're like, yeah, I'm singing too hard. <laughs> right, yeah, and it adds you know, to your confidence. I'm singing too hard, I'm like, ah, oh, I thought that was way better, it's better in my head. <laughs> yeah, but I thought I was nailing that. I thought that. I was yeah. nailing that, <laughs> singing too hard, whatever it is, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and David, I know you mentioned that it protects your hearing, but otherwise, has, how has uh, using inner monitors changed your approach to shows? Well, let's talk about this. As a drummer in the 21st century, two words, click track. Mm -hmm. And also right. like loops and drums. Loops and tracks, tracks yeah. that you're playing along to. You know, once upon a time, there was no such thing. Uh, metronomes have been out for God knows how many years, but incorporated into live, uh, you know, in live application, that was not really done until probably the 80s and in the late 80s maybe, and even then it was prim in primitive form. Mm -hmm. So, um, as a drummer, you can't, you know, you can't be on a wedge and be on a click track, especially if everybody in the band's here, because the audience would hear go, 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 right. coming through their wedges. And how annoying would that be? Brad, from an engineer's perspective, how how does using in in ear monitors versus wedges, how does that affect the sound check and the time spent on sound check? Well, with wedges, the first thing we have to be worried about, especially with singers, is feedback through the microphone. And it's usually a real fine line, especially with a louder band, between having the mic loud enough in the wedges and having feedback, whether reflecting off somebody's face or just coming back through. So I, before soundcheck, have to spend a lot of time making sure that we're not going to have feedback. Um, and I usually go well beyond what I think is loud enough, and sometimes that still is not enough. And so we'll spend sound check still battling feedback and wedges. Within your monitors, of course, that it is an impossibility to have feedback. So that helps me, that helps front of house, it helps the singer, they can hear themselves loud enough without any risk of feedback. And then uh, with as far as putting together the overall mix, when I'm have an artist using wedges, I have to consider what they're already hearing on stage from loud guitar amps, from drums. So I'll start and just keep the wedge mix extremely minimal with only what they really need to hear through the wedge versus what they're hearing on stage. Whereas with in-ear monitors, we're blocking out a lot of what's happening on stage so we can bring those into their ears so they can hear them more consistently and more clearly. You know, that that's a good point. Um... And Katie, I'd be interested to hear your perspective on if you think using inner monitors versus wedges, especially on a longer tour, if that helps prevent like vocal fatigue or protects your voice. Yeah, I was. I mean, I was touching on that before. You don't definitely don't sing as hard because you, you're never dealing with a sound issue. It's not ever going to be about sound or volume. Even if like your preset mix is just a little bit of variation because of the venue or because of grounding or whatever whatever sonic gremlins are happening because sometimes that happens sometimes it's like there's something going on nothing really gets changed and worst case scenario is you just turn your pack up 
just a little bit like you just dial it in just like one more click or whatever and you're like okay it's fine I can hear every, everyone again you definitely don't get vocal fatigue because of in-ears ever if you do then you, your mix is wrong basically you, whatever you're listening to is wrong but wedges it's just a, it's it's like rolling the dice it's great you can have the best mix that it can possibly be in the venue at sound check then as soon as the show starts it's like and it's way different <laughs> and that's usually what happens it's usually way different every single night because of the variation with audience and even though you feel comfortable at sound check it's still like eh, not great right yeah and speaking of that variation in the audience brad from an engineer's perspective do you see any advantages to the show in the venue when the performers are choosing IEMs? Um, yeah, I think so. I think, obviously, uh, as she touched on, people can sing more comfortably. They don't have to sing as hard to if the audience is cheering or talking or whatever the audience is doing at that time, they can still hear themselves clearly. Um, uh, so, and then also, you know, uh, for a performer who wants to hear the audience, you could have microphones pointed at the audience and bring them in at opportune times, maybe not leave them on at all the time, but in between songs. So there can be a dialogue between the artist and the audience. You could bring them back in. Uh, and then when they're performing, you can have them turned off. Awesome. Um, so just wrapping this up a bit, um, do you have any closing thoughts on why someone should consider choosing inner monitors if they have been using wedges, David? Again, I think it's a smart choice only because if you work a lot or you perform a lot, it's m way less taxing on your hearing, um, whether you're a drummer and uh, as a singer, indeed, in terms of not having to push as hard. Yep. And when you have to sing a lot, um, knowing that you don't have to push a lot because uh, you're able to hear yourself comfortably. It's just, to me, it's a no-brainer, but again, I'm a drummer and in-ears were, uh, you know, my limbs were a savior for me because of just how loud the instrument is. And the great thing also about even whether you're on mold or whether you're, you've just got, um, you know, generic ears in, is like even when you play a theater, the core of what you need to hear is there and the room may change a little bit and you're still able to, you're still, there's an aura about the room that you can still pick up even when you've got your ears in, yeah. which I think is a cool thing. Yeah. Um, it's whether, the ambience. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You can, there's an essence of the ambience that's still there beyond uh, what you're listening to in your ears. Um, so you can really hear everything so, so well. You, like you'll never have that problem. You don't get vocal fatigue. If you're feeling ill or whatever it is, you can afford to pull back and rest your voice and just sing the notes or sing a falsetto or just kind of get through it and, you know, rock through the show, do what you need to do. But it's never going to be about like fatigue. Like that's the, that's the best thing you can relax and know that that's the case. Uh, well, thank you all for joining us today, and thanks for sharing all of your different perspectives on inner monitoring, and thank you to all of you uh, viewers out there watching. We appreciate you taking the time to watch, and uh, be sure to stay tuned for video part two coming soon. Don't forget to like and subscribe to see more videos just like this.